Next, we come to Edmund Husserl, who was born in 1859 and died in 1938 CE, and he presents an updated version of Cartesian interactive dualism. Uh, it's an updated version because he is building upon Descartes' basic phenomenological method, but he has to deal with certain objections and modifications that were introduced by David Hume and Immanuel Kant. Um, Husserl begins by describing uh, two different fields of experience, the transcendent field and the imminent field. The imminent field is, of course, the way we experience things from the inside um, and what goes on inside of our minds, the psychological inner field. And the transcendent field is everything in the external world. Um, so we can compare that to Descartes' race extensa and race cogitans. Uh, race extensa, of course, being the extended substance and race cogitans being the thinking substance. So the transcendent field becomes uh, the updated version of race extensa and the imminent field becomes the updated version of race cogitans. Uh, phenomenology is the study of essences leading to the transcendental ego. So the transcendental ego is um, a Kantian construct, um, and it means the self that is necessary in order for there to be a unified empirical self-consciousness. So for Kant, uh, this transcendental ego synthesizes all of the sensations from race extensa and race cogitans, okay, into a uh, synthetic totality. And because it is a condition, a condition for the possibility of consciousness itself, experience itself, it is not directly observable because it's not an object of knowledge. For Husserl, pure consciousness for which everything that exists is an object, it is the ground for the foundation and constitution of all experience and meaning. So again, we have uh, just a sort of an updated version of Descartes' basic philosophy. Uh, essences are platonic. The essences for Husserl are basically identical to platonic forms. And so the transcendental ego, when it begins to evaluate the transcendent field and the imminent field, will begin to look for formal essences that then lead it back to its own self. Um, the method, the phenomenological method, is called phenomenological reduction. And uh, it comes from the Greek word epoche, which means a bracketing of phenomena uh, by disallowing the existence of transcendental phenomena as real. In other words, Descartes had existential import in all of his descriptions of the way that we think and the way that we operate. He thought that they were real, that there really was a race extensa and a race cogitans. However, because of the work done by Hume and Kant, that then became almost impossible to prove. And since we're now sort of locked into a, a, an empirical epistemology, rather than an empirical uh, ontology, because of, because of Kant and Hume, um, basically what happens is you have to bracket things and just say, this is what I experience. And you don't make any claims at all about their reality. You just you just have a, basically uh, a description of what is going on in your consciousness at this moment. Uh, so we have later philosophers like Heidegger, uh, Sartre. Uh, they will utilize this method uh, as the basis for their entire uh, existentialist doctrine. What you will find in, in Heidegger and Sartre are descriptions, phenomenological descriptions of their experience. Um, also, uh, Count Korzybski would base his uh, philosophy upon this particular method. Uh, so we can compare that to methodical skepticism and Buddhist absorptions, and the Buddhist absorptions we'll get to a little later. Methodical skepticism from Descartes uh, was his method of bracketing everything and saying, I can doubt this. I can doubt that this is real. I can doubt that this is true. I can doubt that this is in front of me. Um, and so that was the, the method that he used in order to come up with his major philosophical breakthroughs. 
Next, we come to neuroscience and interactive dualism, which is a, an updated version of this, a modern uh, physical, uh, that is physics-based um, concept of interactive dualism. We begin with Sir Karl Popper, uh, born 1902, died 1994 CE. He was a professor of philosophy at the London School of Economics. And Sir John C. Eccles, uh, born 1903, died 1997 CE. He won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1963 for his work on the electrochemical structure of the synapse. He basically was the one who demonstrated that the synapse uh, is electrochemical in nature. Okay, so basically, if you recall your, your, your high school biology, the transmission of the signal across the synapse is done chemically rather than electrically. So it releases, it releases bunches of chemicals that then cross the synaptic gap and are then picked up on the other side um, from, uh, from the axon to the dendrite. Okay, uh, neuroscience and interactive dualism was presented in joint, a joint work by Dr. Popper and Dr. Eccles. Uh, the self and it's called the self and its brain. Historical, it's an historical presentation of, of uh, all the dualistic theories. And they come down on the side of interactive dualism. Um, in 1994, uh, Dr. Eccles published a book called How the Self Controls Its Brain. Uh, notice that self and brain are capitalized, where he presents uh, the history of the dualistic, of, intera of, of interactive dualism. And then he then presents two papers which present testable quantum models of soul body interaction. Uh, we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, the two primary Publications that present this um, this quantum model um, are called Quantum Aspects of Consciousness, uh, and you can find it out at the website noted there in the Evolution of Consciousness. Also out at uh, the uh, uh, Proceedings of the National of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. And they're both free. You can just log in and, and download them. They're all in PDF versions. Very interesting reading. Okay, we then went to a class discussion, a brief history of dualist interactionism, which of course we won't have here because that's not available. And part two, tranquility meditation and interactive dualism. Detachment, synchronization, coordination, and unification of soul, body, and world. Based upon the interactive dualist model that we're using here. Uh, first, we have to understand uh, electroencephalogram brainwave patterns, and we've identified you know, roughly five different uh, brainwave patterns that are of, of interest. Uh, there's a, a number of different sub-patterns, but the five basic ones are the ones we will discuss now. And keep in mind that the brain is never in one of these states alone. All of these brainwave patterns are, are present at all times, no matter what the state of, of the body is or the body of the brain is. First, we have the slowest, which is delta, which is 0 0.5 to 3.5 hertz. It is a deep, slow-wave sleep pattern. Um, it is the time when the body is basically rebuilding itself, and the body and the mind are completely disconnected. There's no dreaming. There's no awareness of anything that's going on in the external world. Theta is the next highest, uh, 4 to 7 hertz. Uh, this is the, the REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, dreaming sleep. It's completely interdirected. Uh, there's a dreaming or soul body and world detachment. Alpha is the next highest, 8 to 12 hertz. This is a global synchronization and interdirected state. Basically what happens is um, as the body, as the nervous system enters the alpha state, the, the, the nervous system begins to uh, to synchronize across all of the uh, the entire brain synchronizes across the alpha wave pattern and it's a synchronized low energy meditative or hypnotic state uh, our normal waking state is the beta state 13 to 30 hertz it's normal every day on synchronized waking state is completely out of directed it's very spiky uh, it's not synchronized at all. It's uh, it's kind of messy if you take a look at the EEG, as opposed to the alpha state, which is very, very sine wave, uh, very rhythmic. Um, and then finally, we have the gamma state, 31 to 150 hertz. 
it is a global synchronization and outer directed. So whereas the alpha is global synchronization and inner directed in a meditative or hypnotic state, the gamma state is a global synchronization uh, and it is directed towards external activity. Synchronized high energy active meditative hypnotic state. Usually we get the gamma state when we are involved in uh, high energy activities like athletics. So if we take a look at the EEG and dualist interactionism, we see that there are four possibilities here. If there are two distinct but interactive substances, a thinking substance and an extended substance, then the two substances can be detached from one another in the EEG theta state. The two substances can be synchronized with one another in the EEG alpha state. The two substances can be coordinated with one another in the EEG beta state. And the two substances can be unified with one another in the EEG gamma state. So, uh, methodical detachment, synchronization, coordination, and unification of soul, body, and world. The methods of detachment to get us to the theta state, seated meditation, hypnosis, and a waking theta state followed for following from a synchronized alpha state. Uh, there are masters of meditation who basically exist in their normal everyday life in a theta state. And if you've ever met these people, they, they behave very differently than the rest of us because they're, they're in this waking theta state. It's, it's truly amazing to watch. Um, the methods of synchronization for the EEG alpha state are yoga, seated meditation, and hypnosis, which is synchronization of soul and body. Um, the methods of coordination for the beta state, tai chi, martial arts, athletics, walking meditation, golf. There's a coordination of synchronized soul and body and action in four-dimensional space-time, where you're actually out doing things. And finally, methods of unification in the gamma state. Now, Tai Chi, martial arts, athletics, walking meditation can then take you into this high energy, unified and synchronized and coordinated um, uh, state in four dimensional space time. It's a high energy state. You're going to be actually, you know, physically doing things. Your, your professional athletes talk about being in the zone. Um, and this is what they're talking about. They're talking about basically what we are referring to as a, as a gamma state. Uh, the Zen meditation community talks about it breathing, it walking, it moving, it thinking. Um, if you've ever experienced, you know what I'm talking about. It is completely unique, and it's a wonderful experience. Okay, we then went to a Q&A, uh, methodically altering the relationship among soul, body, and world, methodically using all the methods that we've talked about prior. We then had a class discussion, what shall we call the two elements of our experience? Um, and we then discussed the two elements would be soul, race cogitans, myself, myself, me, yourself, you, perceptible objects, race extensive, the extended universe. Uh, we talked about the body being part of the extended universe. All right. Now the body is, it occupies a mid uh, position between the two worlds. Part of it is race extensive, part of it is race cogitans, okay? And from our perspective, we wanted to have a term. The movie Avatar had just been released, which I thought was interesting. So we decided to call the body itself the avatar. Now, the classical definition of an avatar derived from the Sanskrit word avatara, meaning descent. It is the deliberate descent of a deity into the extended universe of four-dimensional space-time into a body, okay, the body of such a deity, which the deity uses for the duration of its descent into matter, is called an avatar. Uh, so that's exactly what we have in the movie, in the Avatar movie. We have consciousness involved in a physical body and operating it uh, for a temporary period of time. So then the next question that, that was asked during class discussion was, who is the most famous of all avatars in the Western world? Of course, the answer to that is Jesus Christ. Um, finally, we went to the practicum where we were exploring the meditative absorptions. Um, we'll have a, we basically had a five-minute review of meditative absorptions, the, the theory behind them, the, the definitions of what the absorptions are. Class discussion, Q&A, five minutes of meditative practice, more class discussion, 10 minutes more of practice, and then an additional class discussion. 
the meditative absorptions come from the Buddhist doctrine. Uh, there are basically it's it's a it's a, a an Agdawadic system, in which means it's 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 based on the number eight. So everything that you see, there's the the noble eightfold path. There's the eight meditative absorptions, so on and so forth. So the first absorption is elimination of unwholesome thoughts and feelings, the production of joy and bliss. The second absorption is the elimination of applied and sustained thought, the absence of discursive thought, the production of rapture. The third absorption is the fading away of rapture and the production of equanimity and mindfulness. The fourth absorption is the disappearance of pleasure and pain. The person, the meditator, dwells in neither pain nor pleasure. Mind and body are fallen off. This is, a, this is your classic meditative state. Um, the fifth absorption, these are higher level absorptions, the base of boundless space. Um, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth absorptions cannot be described, so they just have, you know, basic nomenclature attached to them, a name. Sixth absorption is the base of boundless consciousness, the seventh absorption is the base of nothingness, and the eighth absorption is the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So using the concept of the avatar, provide an operational definition of the eight meditative absorptions. And so if we go back and just go down the list, basically what happens is at from the eighth absorption where you are dwelling in consciousness itself, just pure consciousness with no extension, and then you move step by step by step by step by step until you're down to the first absorption and then into the avatar itself where you're just in normal everyday uh, beta state. So we move in and out. Um, there are reports from the sutras that when the Buddha was dying after he had eaten the poison food, uh, he basically moved through the eight absorptions and then back to the first, from the first to the eighth absorption, back to the first absorption to demonstrate the eight absorptions for the last time, and then he he basically abandoned the, the avatar and, and left. Okay, so if the descent of the deity into the material extended form of the body or avatar is truly a descent, then what would what word would describe the eight meditative absorptions? An ascent. Uh, we, during the practice, when we practiced resonant breathing um, and noted which of the eight meditative absorptions you could experience in the ten minutes where we practiced the resonant breathing. Uh, the resonant breathing is is available on the other live seminars. Finally, we had a class discussion and a preview of Seminar 3. The main topic for Seminar 3 will be soteriology, which is the purpose of tranquility meditation, and the practicum would be the introduction to the fair witness process. The fair witness uh, is a concept we take from Robert Heinlein's novel, um, A Stranger in a Strange Land, where he describes um, that person who can enter a meditative absorption in real time and just describe what is going on without any emotional input. It's, it's an interesting concept. And finally, the homework, download the resonant breathing audio tracks from the website, practice 10 to 20 minutes per day, keep note of which meditative absorptions you experience, begin noticing the difference between your avatar and yourself, that is between the body and, and your consciousness, and begin noticing the difference between other people's avatars and themselves. And that was the end of this seminar.